Hi there, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Virginia Clean Cities Technology Happy Hour. This happy hour was recorded in April of 2024 with our partner, Shenandoah Valley Electric Co-op, and they're talking electric co-ops and their roles in the EV transition. If you'd like to know more about Virginia Clean Cities or the SVEC themselves, please check the links below. And if not, enjoy listening. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, some of you may know me, some of you might not. My name is Gregory Brennan. I'm the program coordinator. I'm a program coordinator here at Virginia Clean Cities. And today we have our featured guest from the Shenandoah Valley Electric Cooperative. We have Preston Knight, the communications manager at SBEC, and Cassandra Freisinger, the energy program coordinator. They are coming to us today from SBEC's headquarters over in near Rockingham County Fairgrounds. And the SBEC ser services nearly 100,000 meters across Winchester, Highland County, and Page County. Um, they are a wonderful cooperative, they're a great partner of Virginia Clean Cities. So uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Preston to get things started. Get there. All right, Greg, yeah, thank you for having us today. Um, we always enjoy talking co-ops. and Today we'll have a little bit of a EV slant to it. Um, I took a train a few weeks ago um, and covered, you know, how to give a really good presentation. Then I realized we didn't go over virtual presentations. So everything I I may have learned that day, I don't know if it translates to today. So just want to set up that way and apologize if it's not amazing or anything. Everything I learned didn't apply to virtual. So I'll have to ask that question next time. But I did want to start. I know one thing they I did remember um, is you want to start off with some, you know, good open. And so I need to get it close to my camera, but I wanted to see for those watching if anybody knew who this guy was am i familiar with this now of course i don't know who's watching who can raise their hands or who wants to shout it out or what we're doing as far as audience participation well alan raised his hand um so we'll take it alan you know, that's our good buddy willie wired hand um <laughs> So I said banana man close. Willie does have banana characteristics when you do, uh, I guess, mention it that way. Uh, Willie Wiredhand is the uh, electric co-op mascot, for better or worse. Uh, been around for many decades. Um, wired hand um, gets the uh, is an illusion alludes to tired hands, which were the electrical workers who worked on farmers' fields way back when co-ops got started but the reason i want to show willie because we like him number one but i think um, co-ops a lot of times get stuck talking about way back when and you know we were we were the first ones chartered here in virginia in 1936 and we want to just give you that whole spiel about how co-ops got started and looks back you know 80 some years and that's we appreciate our history and, and like talking about it but i think we need to also be very much in the present and Think about the future, which we do, but we sometimes don't always talk about it um, as openly and as uh, readily as we could. And so today's a chance to be a little more in the present and in the future. No offense to Willie, and we'll keep Willie right here as my uh, support stuffed animal. Um, but it's a good chance again for us to talk uh, a little bit uh, present and future and within the realm of EVs as well, of course, is, is the main way of, of doing that. So we go ahead and get rolling with the, the next slide. We do have to at least um, step back a little bit um, for those who may not quite know the difference between what we are and others. Um, you know, we are a little partial to liking the co-op business model and uh, and all that, but there are three different ones here in Virginia and I guess really across the country. You got investor owns, which would be like Dominion, uh, and you got uh, municipalities, government owned, uh, and locally here, that'd be HEC, Harrisburg Electric Commission. And then there's us, there's uh, electric co ops, and we're one of about 900 across the country. Just a little bit of a different uh, business setup, and we're going to hit on a few things today. Greg, next slide, if you will. Um, just to kind of set the stage, there are different. Uh, types of utilities out there. In Virginia, we're governed and regulated by the State Corporation Commission. So if you live over here and SEC says we serve you over here, you are a, a member and served by SVEC. We refer to our people we serve as members, not uh, customers. 
Um, you could live across the street and that house might be served by Dominion, you're a Dominion customer. Um, so it's a little zigzaggy here and it'll be a map here in the next, uh, uh, in a minute. Um, it's just a little wonky sometimes in certain parts of Virginia, especially around here, uh, when actually having municipality plus an investor owned plus us um, in certain parts of our territory. But um, when you talk co-ops, we start always uh, with the seven co-op principles. It's not just uh, the electric co-op world. Um, every co-op is founded upon seven core principles. So around here, you think about the around here being Harrisonburg. Uh, I'm not sure how many people are outside of Harrisonburg on today, but um, the Friendly City Food Co-op comes to mind. Um, October is co-op month, so it's past October. We try to grab a few snacks from different co-ops around the country. Tillamook up there in Oregon is one. Um, Ocean Spray, we got what, Blue Diamond was in there, Welch's. Um, those are all the different food and farmer type co-ops. There, there are a lot, a lot of co-ops at every corner, it seems like, that you don't think too much about. Um, and we're just one of uh, many electric co-ops and, and one of a type of co-op that's out there. Uh, again, about 900 or so electric co-ops around the country. And we'll get a map here in the next slide, kind of give you a, a sense about our territory. You know Greg mentioned um, uh, general synopsis of, of what we are all the way up, up to Winchester, Frederick County, near the West Virginia line, on down even past uh, what the map shows you here to the south, uh, down toward the southern end of, of Augusta County. Um, I want to hit on a couple of uh, co-op principles there um, today, not, not all seven, but in the context of just helping you all maybe better understand co-ops and maybe be, you know, a little bit of advocate for us too when the day is over and Next time you hear about co-ops uh, on the road and you get a chance to uh, call back to this uh, little presentation and say, well, you know what, that they're actually uh, very member centric and member focused and they're, they're worth, you know, fighting for. Um, and ownership and governance and the democratic member control uh, principle is one of them. Uh, at least for us, we have nine directors. Um, we actually have 10, but we're migrating to, to get to nine, uh, a transition here after this year, I'll be nine. And they serve three-year terms, and uh, we have elections every year. So um, members of ours, those who receive electric service, if they uh, want to run for the board, um, they're welcome to. Um, there's a little petition process. They need to get 50 signatures, um, but we think it's a pretty low threshold to reach if you want to get on the board of directors in terms of at least get on the ballot. And then all of our membership then gets a vote on who serves on the board. Um, so what we like about that is the people who um, kind of oversee the policies here, they're, they're, the they're your neighbors. You see them at the grocery store, in church, uh, at you know, ball games, wherever else. Um, they're very present and active here in the community um, with those who also receive service from us. So we don't rely on people who are in different states or are far off from us. Um, Valley people are overseeing Shannon Valley Electric. So that's what we like to fall back on as our one of our core principles here uh, in terms of, um, you know, really wanting to look out for our members. And on the next slide, another map, um, just more context about what we serve or how much we serve. We're pretty large for a co-op, um, not to get into the whole history again, because we don't want to um, don't want to offend Willie here. I don't want to talk about history too much, but co-ops really sprung up to serve rural America. Um, and so here we are 80 years later, as far as SBEC is concerned. And we've got uh, even more than that miles of line, uh, 8,000 and some miles of line, which you can see would make it all, if you strung them all out, wrap around the country. Um, as far as co-ops go, again, out of the 900 or so in the country, I think we're in the at least in the top 40 as far as number of meters served. Um, but we're definitely uh, one of the larger ones. I mean, there's some co-ops, um, they're, they're pretty tiny, serve one or two counties and have employees who um, really have to do do it all. They would probably climb a line and come back and answer calls as a member service. But um, we've got about 240 employees and, and we need that many to serve up and down the valley from Winchester on down uh, past Stanton. Uh, it's a pretty wide reaching uh, territory. We've got a lot of re residential members. We have some industry, uh, obviously some industry, agricultural and commercial. So all walks of life are what we serve and they all have different needs. Um, 
We serve, again, a city of Winchester, which is pretty fairly dense for what a co-op serves. And then we have the remote parts, again, Highland County, Page County, and uh, Frederick going down to Augusta. Um, so different expectations and needs and all that in terms of, uh, of what we have for a co-op. Uh, but we again, we always fall back on those core principles and we want to represent those in Highland County just as much as we do those in downtown Winchester. Um, next slide, Greg. We'll um, move on to, again, the co-op business model, but we uh, kind of like to highlight uh, our rates are set just to, to cover our expenses. So at the end of the day, if we do have uh, any uh, expenses left over, any margins left over, um, our board will look at things and eventually vote on whether or not to return capital credits, uh, what they called. Um, and it's basically money back for our members based on how much they spent or were charged for electricity um, in a given year. Um, so we don't set rates to fall back on this large cushion is have money laying around. We, um, our revenue source um, is our members. Um, so we rely on their timely payments each month uh, to get us through the year, um, to get through operating expenses. And at the end of the year, if um, it ends up that we are able to come under, uh, that money gets back to our members through uh, bill credits over time. And if you move away, um, we'll track you down, get a check to you, um, if and when those credits are then uh, returned and, and retired and uh, our board makes that decision. So um, another advantage to us, again, we like to be locally governed and locally uh, operated, but um, we don't fall back on if we need some cash flow, call an investor up uh, up in New York or out in Los Angeles or something, and hey, can we just uh, get some money over here? That's not the way we do business. The co-ops operate on um, getting our members to, to pay for service each month, and our rates and our charges are all built up. Um, and we can get way into the weeds about how rates are structured and all that. We don't want to do that today, that's for sure. I don't want to do that. That's um, that's not a very happy area talking rates for an hour, um, I'll tell you that. But we do just generally want to promote this member economic participation uh, principle we have. And again, if we end up coming uh, under budget, and we have fortunately been able to do that uh, really from as long as I've been here for a decade and going back even farther. And if we're able to do that, we'll then um, be able to return money back to our members. All right, we'll make a little transition here, Greg. Nice smooth transition to eventually get the EVs in this section. But um, one final um, uh, co-op principle, kind of our favorite here is our concern for community. Uh, this is where we really get to get out and and be a part of um, you know local governments and economic development and saw the good stuff going on as well. Um, in addition to um, you know policy making and trying to do good for the people that we serve. Um, this is where it all falls into play. Um, the best way we represent that is Operation Roundup. Um, good timing today. If if you're part of a nonprofit organization here in the Valley or serving anybody in the Valley, we have a deadline next Wednesday, May 1st, uh, for our next round of giving. But Operation Roundup kind of uh, is a call back to how co-ops got started. Um, you can round up your bill each month to the next dollar, and that extra change gets thrown into a big pot of, of money and nonprofits um, like Sustainability Matters is the one shown here on the screen can apply for funding. And we have a committee that meets. It's a committee outside of our co-op. It's uh, made up of, of co-op members, but um, they will go ahead and decide um, which ones get um, supported each, each quarter. We try to do that uh, three times a year, not quite quarterly. Um, so if you're an SVC member, think about rounding up your bill. And if you're part of a nonprofit, uh, in the area um, or know of one, let them know. We have a deadline coming up. And if not this one, we'll go at it again later this year. Um, but we serve close to 80,000 people. So if it's just, a, it's less than a Starbucks cup of coffee for a year. You round up your bill, it averages out to 50 cents a month, multiplied by 12, it's six bucks a year. And if we can get, you know, tens of thousands of people um, on our rolls there just for that, that can be a significant change. So that's kind of, uh, co-op way of doing things is just kind of at the ground level, get everybody uh, individually taking uh, responsibility and, and wanting to do better for the area. Um, that's our way we're doing it through Operation Roundup. Um, but EVs as well, Concerned Community extends uh, in many different ways and making a transition here. Um, 
we go on to the next slide. Um, some of the things we do, not just for the community, but also on a, a co-op level in terms of being supportive and, and having uh, good education for our members for our EVs. Uh, we'll segue into it here. This week, actually, we're doing um, some fire and rescue emergency response training. This is with the help of our um, wholesale energy provider, Old Dominion Electric Cooperative. Um, that's a whole other thing to get into about the, we actually are a distribution co-op, so we get the electricity to your house or business or whatever else, and it actually comes from ODEC, our power provider. Um, one thing they're offering is uh, there's a company out in the Midwest, and he, the instructor there in the red is from Minnesota. He's here this week uh, meeting up with some uh, career staff and volunteers and all the almost all, all the counties that we serve. We've been in Augusta County and Rockingham, uh, got to the city of Harrisonburg and Winchester, and as we speak, getting ready to do one up in Page County, uh, just introducing and somewhat sometimes introducing, but at least uh, giving our uh, first responders a deeper look into EVs. Um, I, I think I know a tiny bit, but then it, so I don't know what first responders know um, about EVs. But sitting through the the training, I really realize I don't know anything. Um, and just it stood out to me for all these first responders, uh, you think about I-81, you know, coming through our territory and who knows how many EVs are passing by every day. And if one gets into an accident or something happens, you got 90 some different manufacturers of EVs and each one seemingly has a different process and, and where you find the battery and what to do in terms of if there is a fire and how to shut the thing off and how to stabilize it and all these other things. Um, it, on top of just what their normal job is, the first responder, it feels pretty overwhelming to me, but um, the least we can do is try to introduce them to EVs and uh, all the complexity uh, involved if, unfortunately, if something were to happen in terms of an accident require 911. So this week we've had pretty good uh, participation in these trainings and uh, it's a pretty nice resource that uh, ODEC offered and we're glad to be sort of the connection there between the first responders and then the, the trainer there again in red uh, going to offer that up this week. Um, and hopefully it never comes into play for any of these uh, volunteers or career staff, but if, if one little thing stood out to them this week and they can apply that to their uh, daily response, then we, we did our job. Um, but hopefully again, it never comes into play, but um, I think just at least for them to be introduced to the, the complexities again of, of an EV, uh, which have come a long way, uh, and then all the different types. Uh, I think we're uh, doing our part again on that. All right, next slide. Speaking of EVs on a little smaller scale, um, we have teamed up with a, a nonprofit up in uh, out of DC, actually. But um, the main the main guy actually lives in our territory up in Frederick County. For the last few years, we've hosted what's called the Shenandoah Valley Electric Vehicle Grand Prix at our office here in Rockingham. Um, and we linked up with, um, we've got about a dozen schools involved up and down our territory. And they can buy these little kits, uh, which we sponsor and ODEC as well. Our power provider is, is giving them some money and they seek out some sponsors too um, to pay off for these kits. But the kids get really involved in terms of just learning how to build a kit from scratch. And then, they will come to our facility and they have uh, two 30 minute heats and whoever has the most laps after those two heats and the battery the battery that lasts the longest gets you the most laps. Um, they end up being victorious, but it's not just about uh, learning about EVs necessarily, but there's a lot of uh, just process information, STEM related sort of things that they're learning along the way. Also sportsmanship and there's a, public relations side too, they're supposed to market their um, car amongst their school population and school body. And they produce these little um, um, sort of hype videos and photos and they get rewarded for that too. But just the basic uh, understanding of data collection and communication between a driver and, and kids from the inside, communicate with the driver, how much battery life is left and how do we make weight and how do we trim some weight here and there? How do we get a little bit faster, get a little more battery life. It's been really cool to see how they have developed over time uh, into these miniature EV experts and whether or not they buy EVs down the road and um, do anything with EVs is not, is not the primary goal of the whole thing, but it 
I'm sure it's going to stick in their mind as they progress through um, college and, and past college, um, what it goes into building the EV and um, really the what you got to keep in mind to be on the road um, as far as having this type of vehicle. Uh, and so hopefully we can impact some lives there as a co-op, which again, we're serving a lot of rural America here in Virginia. Um, our, our membership, and at least those who get most involved with us, tend to be on the older side. So just to get uh, 100 high schoolers on our property, that never happens. So um, it's good for us as a co-op just to say, hey, we're here. And uh, hopefully that builds uh, some advocacy for us over time, too. There's an international connection bullet point there. We had Harrisonburg High School, which won our local race. Um, they went overseas to Abu Dhabi um, as part of international competition. So same sort of deal locally, but on the international scale. And uh, they finished third and the team out of Augusta County finished first. They both, they also raced, they both were at our local one. Um, so really neat opportunity for them to get uh, a chance to visit a country that they probably won't otherwise visit, um, at least not in high school. Um, that wasn't something uh, the co-op sponsored or paid for or anything, but an opportunity through the um, other company we worked for to put on a local race. They got to go overseas. So um, uh, kind of a reminder to us that our concern for community community goes beyond just our valley here. Um, and that we provide we provide service to the to the valley, um, but we really want to extend further out. And so getting them exposed to a whole new country is kind of cool. And I think the next slide here, we'll show you a little bit, some, some of these cars in action. Let's see if it races, there we go. So yeah, you get a sense there on, uh, you know, kind of how fast they were going. They don't speed too much. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of twists and turns, especially our racetrack, um, our racetrack, our parking lot. We didn't really build a racetrack here at our facility. Uh, so we'll, we'll keep that in mind, I guess, uh, in, in future years, we got to build a racetrack. But um, you kind of got a sense there of, of what they had to deal with. And again, a great opportunity for, for those kids and for us um, to kind of talk about EVs and get the start to finish of an EV. Um, what we're doing more uh, on a corporate level, I guess, uh, a few years ago, we adopted a clean power plan and uh, pretty much a copy and paste from it. Uh, the, the EV portion is on the screen there, but um, it just spells out in a general sense that we are going to be supportive of EVs, um, that we do want to support adoption in our territory. Um, we want to help build out a charging network as we can, and Cassandra will pick up on that here in a second. But um, this clean power plan does exist. Um, it was something that was missing in our in our filing cabinet, I guess, and what we something we could call back and, and fall back on. Um, but I think it's important for us just to have some goals stated there in terms of how we want to adopt not just EVs, but kind of approach solar and then uh, working with ODEC, our power providers, over time how our transition will go into just a, a greener future for us. But I uh, just wanted to note that we do have a clean power plant on our website, svec.coop. Uh, we'll be glad to share it with anybody, but just does spell out again um, how we want to pick up where we left off or where we started from you know 80 years ago, not to get in the history again, but just that, that we are looking uh, to the future. And, uh, and one way to do that is with EVs. And with that, I will mute and Cassandra, I think, is going to pick up with a little more details about what we do and what we tell our members about EVs and the resources we have available. Hello. Hello. That is echoing. Oh. Oh. Let's try that. Oh, that's better. <laughs> All right. Can everyone hear me? Yes. 
I can. <laughs> okay. As long as Greg can hear me, we're good to go. It's good. Um, <laughs> again, I'm Cassandra Freisinger. I'm the energy program coordinator here at Shenandoah Valley Electric Cooperative. Um, Preston talked about some great stuff that's going on. Um, I actually attended the firefighter training that we did for Rockingham and Harrisonburg yesterday. And I thought the turnout was great. I mean, when you're having to drag more chairs into the room, I, I I feel like that's pretty successful. And I don't think people would be showing up if they didn't feel like it was worth their time. So I, I just think that's a great thing that's going on right now. Um, another great resource we have um, through ODEC um, is this Choose EV resource on our website. Actually, all 11 of their distribution co-op members have access to this to put it on their website. But basically, it's a really good resource for anyone who's considering an EV and wants to get a little more information, or if maybe somebody has an EV, but they're not sure where to find, like you see, there's home charging, public charging, maybe you just need a little more information. Um, it's a wonderful resource on our website, but if any of you do have EVs and you go browsing through it and you're like, oh, this would be like really good information I wish I would have known, like drop me an email. Um, clear result is always adding more modules to this thing. And, you know, they're open to suggestions on things that can be improved on the website as well. All right. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, this is just going to be kind of a, a generic overview of the levels of charging and what kind of we're looking at as a co-op on our end with each type of charging. Um, just like every co-op is different, every electric vehicle program at the co-ops are different. And of course, our mission and purpose is always driven by our members. Um, so that's right. I was going to have you drop the link to the clean power plan in the chat. No. Um, so the first level of charging we have is level level one charging. I think everyone's pretty familiar with that. That's where you're just plugging your EV directly into a 120 volt wall outlet. Um, it's the slowest type of charging out there delivering 1.4 to 1.9 kilowatts. Um, it is a minimal impact on our distribution system. I like to say it's like plugging in a space heater. Um, but I don't want anybody to be fool fooled by this because it can feel like you're saving money by using a 120 outlet. But at the end of the day, your vehicle needs the same amount of kilowatt hours to operate. It's just how fast you're charging it. Um, and for reference, um, a 1500 watt space heater or a 1.5 kilowatt pole on a 120 outlet can add roughly running 24 seven can add roughly a thousand kilowatt hours to your monthly bill, which translates to about $130. So for some people seeing their bill go up by about a hundred dollars a month, when they get that EV and plug it in can catch them off guard. Um, it, cause it's not a small amount. Um, but overall, I do think there's a place for level one charging in the community. It's great for like plug in electric hybrids, um, and I also think it's great um, at airports where you have long dwell times, anywhere, anywhere you've got a long dwell time for a vehicle, a level one outlet is a really great application. Um, all right, we'll jump to the next slide. So the next level of charging you see is level two charging. Um, this is plugging your vehicle into a 240 volt receptacle or having a charging station either plugged in or wired into a 240 volt circuit. Um, those have a much wider range. You're going to see anything from 2.5 kilowatts to 19 kilowatts um, from those Ford Station Pros. It really just depends on the amount of amperage behind the breaker and the acceptance rate of your vehicle. Um, you can find them at homes, businesses, workplaces. Um, level two is a pretty common thing to see around town. Um, and just looking at residential level two charging, since most of our membership is residential, um, we look at a lot of the technology in the homes and our standard residential loads about 10 kW. And when you're talking about adding a 19 kW charger out there, you can start tripling your demand. Um, and some people are like, well, what does that mean? So, <laughs> Um, many of our rural residential services are on what we call like a 25 kVA transformer. Maybe they're even on something smaller. And that transformer does a great job um, managing the electricity coming into the home. 
And sometimes in the winter, it might be able to get overloaded a little bit. Say your resistance heat kicks on um, on a really cold day and it's running for 20, 30 minutes and then it kicks back off. Um, that transformer has plenty of time to dissipate the heat after it's been overloaded. An EV charger is not the same thing though. An EV charger, you plug in that EV and it will run at that top load for hours. Then the transformer does not have a chance to dissipate the heat. It just keeps running at that overloaded state until it eventually fails. And that that's that's where we start to get concerned because that affects your power service. That can affect your neighbor's power service if you're running on the same transformer. Um, so we really, really need people to just contact us before installing an EV charger so that we can look at the service. Yeah, make sure that every, bye Sam, that everything is good. Um, and, and just really review things because we don't want people not having power um, when it really could just be prevented with a, a simple look beforehand. All right. And then we'll flip over one more slide. And these are your huge chargers. These are your DC fast chargers. Uh, they're the fastest type of charging. You're not going to find them at a residence. You're only going to find them on three-phase non-residential services, um, your 122 or 8 or 277, 480. Um, they can provide anywhere from 50 kilowatts to 350 kilowatts of power. Um, Depending on the size of the charger, we're looking at this and we're seeing a load that's the equivalent of a brand new grocery store opening in our service territory. Like these are just massive loads and no one's really going to sneak up on us with one of these. Um, I'm just being honest with you. <laughs> they're, they're, they're so big that they're going to need new services. We're going to need to design the service. Um, but unlike a traditional load, we don't really have a way to diversify these. Um, so typically with a grocery store, you'd be able to say, hey, we need this much power, you know, maximum, but they're never really going to use that much power. So you can diversify that a little bit. But EV chargers, if someone comes in and says, I'm installing five 150 kilowatt DC fast chargers, we have to install 750 kVA three-phase transformer because we have to guarantee that if all five of those stalls are full, that there is power there for everybody to be able to charge. Uh, speaking of transformers, supply chains are still not back to normal levels um, since COVID, our favorite word. Um, so starting the conversation early with the utility, is, it's just really important. Um, not only can we you know, get equipment ordered and secured for you. We can talk about site design and, hey, if you were to move the chargers to this side of the parking lot, you could reduce your conduit runs. Um, you could reduce a lot of the infrastructure you have to do. We're really willing to have those conversations to try and make this process as easy as possible and also provide real, real realistic timelines um, for what it's going to take on our end to get the equipment that you need. Um, then bottom there, we we do serve one Tesla supercharger. Um, it's not in Mount Jackson. Uh, that one is served by Dominion, I believe. Ours is in Strasburg. Um, it, it, what used, I think, to be a Denny's, but now it's called the Strasburg Diner. Um, but it's been a really interesting case study to watch because um, the utilization on the thing must it, it must be growing because load factors keep going up. And as load factors keep going up, the cost for that electricity, you know, that keeps going down. That per kWh rate that they are being charged is going to go down with higher load factors. So utilization um, is really key on that. And I think we have one more slide. All right. So one way to hopefully avoid overloading a transformer besides contacting us and talking ahead of time is to charge your EV off peak, meaning outside the hours of 6 to 9 a.m. or 4 to 8 p.m. There's generally less load locally, especially overnight and on the distribution system as a whole. So balancing that EV charging load with the, all the regular loads that happen on a grid is really going to be key to electrification in the future. And uh, I think this is our last slide. And that was, a, we didn't even get into fleet electrification. 
um, large installations of level two chargers and multifamily residences or businesses, parking garages. Like there's just so much <laughs> you could get into with EVs that I'm not going to get into today, but that's what I've got on that. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for tuning in. This has been the Technology Happy Hour with Virginia Clean Cities. Up next, we have a question and answer section. If you have your own questions as you're listening to this later, please feel free to leave them below. If you do not feel comfortable doing that, we have our emails and our websites below. Feel free to contact us, and you're more than welcome to listen in to the live Q&A session. Once again, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Wow, great. Thank you so much, Cassandra and, and Preston, for the presentation. Um, so now I, I would love to see if anyone has any questions, um, any bits of information they would like to add. Um, uh, feel free to either put their question in the chat or feel free to unmute and ask your question. Um, so with that, I'll be quiet and uh, let the questions come forward if you have them. Yeah, Steve, go ahead. Sorry. There you go. I can hear you. There you go. Um, sorry. Regarding the um the peak, are are you guys um gonna at some point offer off peak charging plans where you can put in a smart charger, um, you know, or immediate um a meter charging point or something that can kind of control and schedule that um, to take advantage of a, uh, it's another, it's an incentive, you know, to charge off peak. Yeah, so I don't see, um, I don't think us ever really offering the chargers. Um, there's a couple co-ops that have, the time of use plans in place, the on peak, off peak, and super off peak plans. I do believe those are all whole, whole home time of use plans. So I don't believe they're anything EV specific. Um, I don't know. I'm not involved in the rate making. So I don't know if we have any plans for that at this point. But right now, all of our late, our rates are just, they're flat rates. Okay. Um, sorry. So just to clarify, you have whole home off peak rates, time of use. We do not. There's a couple co-ops in the state that do, okay. but we do not. Yeah, I mean, even a, even a whole house time of use, because someone could buy a uh, you know a smart charger for themselves and schedule it to be off peak. So. Yep, that's why we're just requesting everybody uh, do off peak. Um, we do have the beat the peak program. Um, Preston can talk more to that, but it. I'm going to let Preston talk about that because I'm not sure if it sends a text message or not. Yeah, you can sign up for. Um, She's good. She's good. Sorry for any audio issues or IT issues. We're not in IT, so <laughs> we're we're just used to things messing up on us. Yeah, we do have a beat the peak program, as, as you saw in the last slide. Um, if you sign up for it. You can get a text message and or email uh, the night before we anticipate um, the next day being a, a day of um, high demand. And so that really uh, kind of ramps up in the summertime for us. Um, so we got a little bit of time uh, until June, July, August really is when it really sets in and sometimes over the winter as well. Um, but yeah, you can get a text message or an email from us um, for that program and we send out the alert and it's voluntary and you know, we don't know if you actually um, end up beating the peak so to speak but um, we have a few thousand people signed up for it and so every little just like operation random just like cups way back in the day every little bit helps and it's just kind of a, a ground level thing to get as many people together as possible to do this and on the tail end down the road when we look at rates and what we need to do in terms of any revisions um, that's a big benefit for us Okay, thanks. Thank you for the question, Steve. Um, we had Sandy ask a question um, in the in the chat here. Um, she said that she had a level two charger installed at her barn and they, uh, she did not tell you and she was wondering if electricians needed to report those installations to you. 
They do not. Um, I've incidentally spoken to some electricians who have done some jobs in the area and they were like, oh yeah, I went to this, you know, car dealership and installed some level twos and three chargers. I'm like, I'm sorry, you did what? And uh, I had a nice conversation with them, but um, no, they're not required to report anything. Um, the the county isn't either um, or anything. It's really just a lot of grassroots outreach about where these things are right now. Okay. Um, with that, are there other co-ops in, in the surrounding area of Virginia that that is a thing where you do need to report them? Um, or is that something you may or may not know about? I think most co-ops would want to like want to hear from members if they're okay. installing an EV charger so they can look at it. Um, not all of them have the bandwidth to do a good study on it or really um, dig into it too much, but I, th I think most want to want to know where they're seeing these loads. Yeah. Okay. Um, we had another question in the chat. Um, it's uh, Gary uh, Fink says here, what is the projected load that EVs will place on the grid this year? Um, in addition to normal day-to-day -day usage, is that something you guys have a have a grasp on? I'm sure that's something someone here has a grasp on. Okay. Um, that is not something that I have a grasp on in my area of the co-op, though. Sure. Okay. Sure. That makes sense. Um, let's see. Yeah, thank you for your message, Sandy. I appreciate it. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Yeah, I'll, I'll, this is Gary again. I'll follow up on that. So a previous slide showed that level threes can be upwards of 350 kW, probably a full output. Um, so, you know, I would think that someone here has to have a number that we're going to be, you know, taxing the grid when when folks charge their EVs at a station with level three chargers, how is that being handled and calculated for in the day-to-day -day business? Because this is this is tremendous and upwards of Northern Virginia and all the data centers going in with AI, that's already going to be putting a huge demand on our, our grid in Virginia. Gotcha, <laughs> yeah. So those big uh, DC fast services we're talking about are not um something that are going to happen without a lot of input and a work with the cooperative they are another load they are interconnecting with our system and we're working through that design process with um the developer and to make sure that we can handle the load and they are getting what they need from us as a member of the cooperative um we are aware, I can't, I can't speak to any projects that we are actively working on, um, but we do work with our members on those projects. We know where they're going, we know how big they're going to be, and we are accounting for it. And we study our circuits and we make sure they have the capacity to handle it and um, get the appropriate equipment out there to serve them. So is there any, is there any load shedding being done at, at peak hours if these level three chargers are starting to um, put the grid on the brink a little bit is there any plan for load shedding because a lot of times ev owners will show up to chargers assuming that they are broken when in fact they've actually been turned off for one reason or another any, any uh, i don't know that we have enough level threes to be doing that at this point and i can really okay. only speak to what we're doing here at this cooperative so yeah, I understand. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I, I will tell you that there have been issues with some of the software and some of the firmware on the chargers themselves. So yeah. um, working with the co-op or it, well, whoever your power company is, um, I'm guessing that it's more to do with the charger um, manufacturer and charger manager themselves rather than the power company. Um I will say that secondly, we at Virginia Clean Cities uh, have a pro program called Mid-Atlantic Electrification Partnership, where we have installed quite a few uh, level two chargers across Virginia, Maryland, DC area, a few um, 
DC fast chargers. And those, um, we work, I mean, at all level twos and specifically the level threes, we work specifically and directly with the power companies um, in those regions. And so some of those are co-ops like SVEC. Um, so, I mean, if someone is going to install something like that, um, there will be direct engineering and drawings and planning done with the power company to make sure that, that there is load and that there won't be these issues of where like it's turned off because they don't have power. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Oh yeah. And I, and I would think that's where I was concerned Yeah. that, you know, the question you know, I had in my head was we, you've got to know where these projected loads are going to be. Just like if I'm going to be wiring up a building, I've got to go through the permitting process, design process, all that good stuff. And then the power company gets involved to say, okay, we've got X amount that we can provide in here. If you need more, then we're going to have to get our engineers involved and put additional transformers and capacity. And that's sure. where it's like when people start throwing up all these EV chargers, you know, I would think that that would definitely be, a, I would say level two and up, obviously. Um, that would definitely be a load that any co-op or, you know, the power company would want to know about um, that could possibly put extra, extra demand on their system. Sure. That's, just, that's, that's just some thoughts. Yeah. Appreciate it, Gary. Um, uh, we had a question here with, with, from Zach Hurst. Um, he says, I'd be curious to know if SVC has plans to help EV owners that are looking to take advantage of the uh, vehicle to grid cap capabilities of vehicles. Are there any programs with SVC that incentivize that or uh, make that a part of your load? Yeah, we do not have any EV incentives or vehicle to grid programs at this time. Um, we've discussed vehicle to grid internally and, and what it kind of means and how you look at it in the future. Um, but there's a lot of you know, not only like physical technology hurdles, but also like regulatory hurdles for how do you interconnect a vehicle for something like that to do grid. So no, there's nothing at this time. I mean, it, it's on our radar, um, Zach. We're, we're definitely talking about it, but nothing at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Zach. Uh, well, if anyone doesn't have any other questions, one last call here. Um, I will let everyone go a few minutes early. Um, I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, I really appreciate the active questions, active listening. Thank you, Cassandra and Preston for presenting. And once again, thank you for listening to the Tech Happy Hour with Virginia Clean Cities. If you, again, have any other questions, want to know more about becoming a stakeholder of Virginia Clean Cities, or want to know more about EVs or other alternative fuels, please reach out to me, Greg Brennan, the program coordinator, not the, but a program coordinator with Virginia Clean Cities. My email is below this video. And once again, thank you, and we'll see you next time.